check shall we get... okay uh, let's get started um okay so uh good afternoon and welcome to the live event for the second grace uh, racing competition my name is Shayan mitra i'm a professor at the university of illinois at urbana champaign and the whole grace team is actually here we are sitting in the same room. Oh, you can't see them because I have my virtual background on, but they're all here and they'll, uh, many of them will speak to you shortly. So um, let us get started. Um, uh, this is a joint effort with the uh, University of Illinois and University of Michigan. And uh, this, is, this effort is uh, sponsored by National Science Foundation. And most recently we also uh, received a grant for the NSA's Science of Security program for some outreach related activities that you'll hear about uh, later. Okay, so let's uh, get started. The plan for our presentation today is to tell you about the Grace Autonomous Racing Competition. This is version 2.0. For those of you who have been with us over the last year, you'll see some exciting new changes. Um, and then we will uh, discuss the results from this year's race. And after that, we will have a short break and have the participants uh, talk about their experiences and any feedback uh, they might have. And the last part would be opening it up for everyone to uh, have a discussion about how we might improve uh, this event for next year. Okay, I assume everyone can hear me okay. And uh, by the way, this is a informal-ish meeting. So feel free to interrupt and um, insert questions and comments as we go through the presentation. Okay. So uh, racing has been at the forefront of engineering. It's an exciting way to sharpen our optimizations that come with all kinds of engineering into a single event uh, that gets people excited. So we have had vehicle races, sailboat races, and of course, uh, most recently, the autonomous uh, urban challenge. So racing uh, is at the frontier of autonomous systems. Uh, many of you uh, know about the Indie Autonomous Challenge that happened this year. Very exciting, full size autonomous uh, racing cars were built and tested at Indianapolis Racetrack. There are also very interesting scientific research uh, coming out of uh, racing. And uh, racing is just not uh, about cars, it's uh, drones and airplanes and all kinds of uh, autonomous races are being created. And F-110, of course, is the beloved uh, platform that has come out of the CPS IoT community that is now super popular. So you might wonder then why uh, yet another race and what is special about this grace competition. So you can think of uh, all of these different races and competitions as trying to scale a big mountain or go towards a general goal of developing a superhuman, super intelligent racing machine, right? So we are all striving towards this common goal. And these different competitions are scaling that mountain by looking at different gradients in that mountain. And GRACE is also doing the same thing, but we look at the gradient through a particular lens, uh, which I'm going to describe to you, and that's what makes the competition a little bit different. So our uh, mission is to focus on generalized racing, to focus on software, and we have a slight bias towards symbolic methods. Uh, let me explain what we mean by that. So generalizable is pretty obvious, right? So unlike a F1 racing where you're really sharpening your team and your 
uh, vehicle and the driver for a particular track and a, for a particular car, what we are striving to build is a general piece of intelligence software that can be ported to many different scenarios and many different kinds of vehicles. It's a slightly different kind of challenge when you want this type of portability and robustness. Secondly, we are focusing on software. So of course, a real racing machine has a very important hardware component and very important complex optimizations, co-design that has to happen. But by focusing on software, it also unlocks certain other challenges that perhaps get lost when you have to do complex co-design and hardware testing. For example, we can test our software in much more complicated scenarios. We can afford to crash much more freely. We can develop sophisticated algorithm and decision-making processes while pausing time and doing a lot of heavy computation, which is a luxury that a real hardware-based racing competition cannot afford. And finally, symbolic bias. Machine learning is here and is going to play a very important role in transforming how complex systems are built. And we are very much welcoming of solutions that use machine learning in our competition. At the same time, we believe that there are going to be solutions and spaces in this landscape that I described earlier, where physics and algorithms and solutions from first principles are going to play an equally important role. And we have a slight bias towards exploring those solutions. And therefore, our competition is focusing on what we call the post-perception part of a racing machine. So we are not really worrying about how do you detect the lanes, how do you detect the pedestrians. We sort of get those things for free with what we call a perception oracle. And instead, we want our competitors to focus on the algorithms, the decision logic, the learning that comes after the perception piece. Okay, so enough words. Uh, here is our um, dramatic <laughs> trailer for this uh, competition that we have created. I hope you're get, getting the sound. Okay, so uh, that's what the tracks and the race looks like. Uh, here, what you're seeing is a uh, clip of this race happening or the different controllers that we received from the different participants running on the same track. So it's pretty exciting as you see uh, the cars navigating around obstacles and going through the different waypoints and landmarks, and we'll talk a lot, lot more about it uh, briefly. Now, let me give you the highlights of what is new this year. So GRACE is an open source simulation-based autonomous racing competition, and it is also equipped with a fully automated testing pipeline. So as a participant, 
you submit your controller. We'll talk about the interfaces and the constraints on the controller briefly, but once the controller is submitted, we have created a pipeline which allows us to run your controller on different vehicles and different tracks automatically and generate results, which as you can imagine, is a very interesting software testing exercise in itself. So what is new this year is reacting to popular demand from last year. We have made available AWS images on which uh, participants can develop their controllers without having to pony up a large hardware platform because these simulators require a pretty significant computation. Uh, this year also we have enabled multi-vehicle racing. So the controller codes from two different participants can race against each other on the same track simultaneously. We have a leaderboard, which many of you would have seen already for posting the results, not quite in real time, but enables quick feedback on how your controllers are doing. And of course, the most exciting part is that we have many, many more participants and races running this time. So we feel like we have really gained quite a bit of momentum uh, over the last several months. So once again, uh, welcome all of you and thanks so much for participating and making this an exciting uh, event for all of us. And this has been possible because of our amazing team. So I'll introduce them and then um, the Grace team will take it from here. So first we have uh, Jan. Uh, Jan has been the technical leader of this project over the last semester, he's a graduate student at University of Illinois, and you'll hear more from Jan uh, right after me. Uh, Dawe Soon is also a graduate student in Illinois, and you may remember Dawe from last year's presentation. He has been a bedrock of the technical development that has been happening in the background, particularly the testing pipeline. Christina Miller is also a PhD student at Illinois. Uh, Christina has been in contact with many of you and has been a leader in many of our outreach activities and also uh, in the technical development side. And we have three amazingly talented undergraduate students, Raj, Junyan, and Lucas, who unfortunately are not able to make it to the meeting today. I don't know if any of you are signed in now, but this also happens to be the uh, finals week at Illinois. So uh, uh, they've been working very hard on this project throughout the semester, but they couldn't make it to this meeting right now. Okay. So with that, I'll uh, hand off to Jan. Uh, Jan uh, is going to talk about give you a little bit more detail about the architecture of Grace. Okay. Sorry, uh, I made a, a mistake there. Actually, Dawe is going to talk about the architecture of the race, and then Jan is going to talk about the results later on. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, hello everyone. My name is Tavi Sang and I'm a third year PhD student from Giants Corp. And uh, so next I will talk about the uh, the architecture, the, the software infrastructure of this like for this competition. Uh, so here you can see like an overview of the Grace 2.0 architecture. And uh, uh, so first we are using three external like well-developed uh, libraries. Uh, uh, first one is the color simulator. And uh, we are also using the 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 ROS. Uh, and uh, of course we are using uh, we are also using uh, using Python. And uh, so here you can see like we have many blocks in this uh, uh, in this overview, right? And uh, so the this 
So this largest one is the Carlos simulator, which is um, which computes the, like the physics and uh, and uh, the the pictures, and uh, so and then we have the like a uh, perception oracle. So in this competition, like the competitor uh, only has to focus on the design of the controllers, which means like they don't have to worry about the like the perception module. So the perception oracle will directly uh, take the ground truth from the simulator and uh, extract the information like like the obstacles, the viewpoints, and everything else, and then give that to the controller. So the controller uh, does not have to like uh, do some image processing or something else. Yeah. And uh, and uh, then we, we also have the evaluation module, which will take the like the state from the simulator and uh, compute a score for the uh, performance of the controller. And so, and we like uh, we have this like risk configuration, which means like uh, this risk configuration will define uh, like a race. So you can see like we have several components in this configuration. The first one is the risk tab. And we will also have like the, the risk track. We have many options for, for track and we have different scenarios and we, we also have like different vehicle models. So next I will like elaborate on all these blocks. And uh, so the first one is the controller. So we defined uh, like a standard uh, interface. So which means the competitor has to follow this interface and implement a controller, right? And, uh, so here we basically define the input and output of the controller. Uh, so the input, the input is the, the sensing and the perception information from the perception oracle. So the oracle will uh, provide the, 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 the ground truth about the, like, the obstacles, the current state of the vehicle and uh, the current lane and the, the next waypoint uh, to the controller, yeah. And uh, the output of the controller uh, is also standardized. Uh, so this standardized control commands so, uh, allows for a connection with a variety of vehicles, which means like uh, you design a controller and this controller can be used to control different vehicles right? because they all follow the same uh, standardized uh, control commands. Yeah. So here we provide two options. Uh, the competitor can either use uh, uh, can either output a uh, steering uh, and the throttle signal uh, to the simulator. They can also like use the ACMA control uh, uh, format, uh, which means like you provide a targeting uh, a target uh, steering angle and a target speed, and then we will have a low level PID controller to to, uh, to match uh, uh, the vehicle uh, speed to the target. And uh, so this is the controller. And then um, we'll talk about the, the risk configurations. Uh, if you remember, like we have like several components in this configuration, right? The first component is the risk tab. So here we have two options. The first one uh, is the solo risk, which means you are the only like uh, uh, controlled car on the track. And uh, we will, uh, but, but you will also see some NPC cars, like uh, some pedestrians, but you are the only like a uh, controlled car. And uh, so we will measure like uh, the collisions and uh, the race time and, uh, um, and the land departure. And uh, then we compute a score uh, for this controller. And uh, the next option is the head to head race, which means like we will have two, uh, like, uh, two vehicles on the track controlled by the uh, controllers submitted by two separate teams. And uh, uh, they will like, uh, they can interact with each other and try to overtake each other. And uh, yeah, that's it. And the next component is the race track. So here we have five options. So uh, we designed like uh, five tracks uh, and uh, which can be imported into Carla and uh, uh, so this one is the like simplest one. So in this one, we don't have any sharp turns. Uh, it's just uh, the default one provided to the competitor. Uh, they can use this one to, to make sure like that the pipeline works, right? And uh, so there is no interesting scenario uh, or uh, features on this track. 
and then we uh uh, we designed like several like more realistic, more complicated tracks. So for, for example, in this one, we have a, a, a viaduct in this in the middle of the map, which means this this map, it, this track is not completely plain. So uh, which has some like uncertainty to the race. Right? And we also like um, uh, so in the uh, in this track and this track, you can see like uh, we tried to uh, like uh, so they, they are from like uh, two realistic uh, tracks in like from I guess Europe and uh, we try to uh, yeah so you can see like there there are many like sharp turns and uh, uh, strange features in this track so uh, yeah so at, uh, which makes the race interesting. And we also designed like uh, several traffic scenarios using the scenario runner provided by uh, Carla. Uh, so there are all, there are all uh, some like common uh, scenarios like in daily traffic. For example, in this one, you can see like uh, there in front of this car, uh, there is a pedestrian like uh, like crossing the street, right? And the, the vehicle has to avoid the pedestrian. Otherwise, if you hit the pedestrian, you will get a penalty. Yeah. And uh, in this remaining uh, pictures, you can see like uh, we will have uh, a varying number of cars that uh, on the track. They block the the the, the road, and the eagle vehicle has to find a way to overtake them. Or another option is like you just wait, and uh, after several seconds, the, the, the other like the NPC cars will disappear, and you can go. So yeah, so it depends on the behavior of the controller. Yeah, um, yeah. and another uh, it's also worth mentioning that the scenario uh, is independent of the tracks, which means like uh, we can apply like uh, each scenario to different tracks, and we will have many many combinations. And uh, yeah. Uh, and also, like we uh, in scenario runner, we designed like uh, five basic scenario, uh, which we call the eigen scenarios. And uh, so the a real, uh, a actual scenario, like in, in, for example, in the second picture, is a combination of like uh, two eigen scenarios. For example, uh, you will uh, at some time you will see two cars and a pedestrian, so it, which is uh, actually a combination of two eigen scenarios. Yeah. Which also like uh, generates like many many possible scenarios, which makes the uh, the competition more interesting. Um, and uh, as for the vehicle models, like uh, we selected five uh, built-in uh, vehicle models from the model pool of Carla, uh, and uh, they have like different physics, different size, uh, which makes the uh, competition very uncertain. For example. Um, here you can see you can even control this motorcycle to like drive on the track, right? And uh, uh, you can also control this cyber truck, which is like a, a huge car. And uh, compared, I mean, compared to the size of the the road, it's huge and it's very difficult to drive. Yeah. And uh, later on, you will see like some controllers failed to control this large car. Yeah. And uh, the next component uh, in the in the uh, architecture is the evaluation part, like, which means how do we compute the score for the controller? So the score is actually uh, based on the racing time, and with some penalty. So if uh, like if there is some collision, we will add a penalty time to the to the base, right? And uh, if there is some land departure, we will also add some penalty. So that means a smaller score is better, right? Uh, which means you finish the track uh, faster, um, and also if like if in some in, if in some cases uh, like the controller cannot like uh, avoid uh, an NPC car or a pedestrian, and then like we we still want like the vehicle to finish like the remaining scenarios right. So after several collisions, the scenario will be skipped. And uh, if a vehicle does not finish the race, then the score will be penalty. And uh, in the table, it's, uh, it's denoted by D and F, which means didn't finish. Yeah. So the, the lane departure penalty, 
Uh -huh. That's uh, if you leave the track completely, or there's like also three lanes on the track, right? What is, what is the specifics of this lane departure penalty? Uh, I guess Yan knows more details. Mama. Yeah. So this lane invasion means if you go outside of the right boundary or the left boundary of the track. Once you violate, if you go out of the land, we will assign a 10 point penalty to your score. Okay, all right, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's basically the boundary of the track. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, a major improvement this year is, uh, like, uh, is that we are using the synchronized mode, uh, which had more determinism to the computation. So, so, Let's look at this 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 picture, right? Uh, so here we have the Carla simulator and also the uh, 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 a ROS component, which which called which is called like the ROS bridge, which connects the Carla simulator uh, and the controller with some like ROS interface. And uh, so the behavior of the Carla simulator is that it only computes a frame after receiving a tick. And, uh, and in the synchronized mode, the ROS bridge waits for all the controllers like uh, to send the commands and before it calls the tick, which means then the, um, so in, in this way, the Carla simulator and the controllers are synced, right? Uh, so, which means like in each, uh, in each time step, uh, there is only one, control input from the controller. And uh, so it adds more determinism to the, uh, to the execution. And, uh, but last year we, are used, we were using the asynchronous mode, which means like the ROS bridge here, we are not wait for the controller. It just calls the take immediately after Carla simulator computes the previous frame. So in that case, like for each frame, there might be zero control input, there will be no control input or multiple control inputs. So you cannot really control that. So it's very non-deterministic, right? So in that case, uh, Carlos simulator and the controller are not synced, yeah. So that's the uh, uh, improvement uh, this year. Um, yeah, and uh, so we also did some like experiments to show like uh, the benefit of this uh, synchronized mode. So here, uh, we try like uh, run the same uh, same controller on the same uh, track uh, several times, and uh, we compare the like the score distribution of the synchronized mode and asynchronous mode. Uh, the blue one is the synchronized mode, and the red one is the asynchronous mode. So you can see like uh, the the blue one is like more deterministic, and the red one is more like noisy, right? So uh, but you, you you may also notice that there are still some non-determinism in the in the in the synchronized mode, right? And uh, it's from the like the non-determinism uh, in the Carla simulator, and uh, because we are using like the, an old version of Carla uh, simulator, and uh, so it has some it has some internal non-determinism and we are planning to like uh, uh transfer the whole project to the like latest version of Carla simulator and uh, it claimed uh the, the new version is deterministic yeah. so that will be a feature of the uh of next year uh greece competition yeah. and uh, so next uh yan will talk about the the testing pipeline and uh, the results and uh, yeah Thank you. Thank you, Dawei. Hi, everyone. My name is Yan. I'm a first year master's student at University of Illinois. So next, I'm going to present on how our whole testing pipeline is built and uh, the reveal some results and interesting moments of the great competition. So uh, as many of you already seen, uh, what we want to achieve is automation. Basically, you, are, you submit a file through our submission portal and we will do automated uh, evaluation on your controller and then send the email back you know, with the logging information uh, for you to help you debug during the before the dead, uh, competition deadline. 
Uh, that's one of the reasons why we ask for very specific formats of the file submission. We ask some uh, specific hierarchy as some of the participants you are listing. Uh, that is to help us with the automation so that we it can be the controllers can be evaluated with minimum human intervention. Uh, another thing that we already mentioned in the previous slide is we also want to pursue determinism uh, when we evaluate the performance of the controller. That's why in the single agent mode, we use this, uh, the synchronized mode uh, to achieve more determinism. Uh, however, in the head-to-head uh, -head, head -head competition, we decide to go for the asynchronous mode, which we will also go through some more details in the next few slides, uh, because we want to make sure every controller takes in, uh, use, uh, is, is fair to raise the two controller so that the two controller can use exactly amount, the same amount of time to compute uh, the control output for this current decision points. A uh, third point of the design goal we want to achieve is isolation. Uh, that's why we also provided a Docker to every participant, every uh, competitors, so that uh, you don't have to worry about uh, independent library or package installation, since we have uh, set up the whole infrastructure, the simulator, uh, the ROS bridge, and our uh, basic uh, long script for you. Uh, in this way, the competitors can just uh, focus mainly on their controller's design with the Docker. And it also makes sure there's no package or version inconsistency between the simulator we use in testing pipeline and we use uh, we provide to you since the Docker image is uh, exactly the same with the testing pipeline and the image we provide to you, uh, except for some uh, extra testing features uh, we build on that I'm going to talk about right now. So many participants already experienced this whole testing pipeline, uh, but they but on the front end you only see the code source and the result delivery. Uh, in this slide, I'm going to go into more details on how this whole testing pipeline works. Uh, basically, we have a submission portal set up. Uh, it's on the cPanel, uh, it's on, on our uh, server. So as you already see, after you sign up uh, and we give you the password, you can submit your controller file uh, to our server and we will store it somewhere. This year, we are only uh, running, the, uh, running the testing, uh, testing script every day, a proxy every day manually, but in the future, we can definitely think about automate everything. So once you submit the, uh, it's one of the option we were looking into, uh, once con sub submitters uh, submits a controller file, it will be automatically run. So this year, what we did is like uh, render all submission received by the end of the day manually, manually invoke the script, I mean, but the whole testing pipeline is still automated. What will happen next is, we were taking your uh, controller file from the server, uh, from the submission side server, then place it inside our testing pipeline, uh, automatically uh, install the required documents uh, in your uh, Python files or pseudo APT uh, packages. Then we start running the uh, Carla simulator, ROS bridge. Uh, we go into your, uh, the files we just received and we set up the Grace, uh, Grace tracks uh, great racing configurations and starting running your uh, controller file. While we are running the starting accusation and uh, running your controller file, we also record additional data, like what's your score is, what's your car uh, control outputs, what is your location, what is the environment's information. For example, are there other, other obstacles? Uh, where are they and how, how are they moving towards? So, uh, with this process going on, um, we uh, after this process finished, we will provide you the feedback with uh, racing logs, how 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 high you score, uh, where did you uh, lose points, for example, where did you go out of line, uh, where did you collide. We provide you with the video feedback that many participants found uh, very useful in debugging and help them see what's going on wrong. We also provide you with the raw data, which shows you. Uh, exactly what the simulator is doing at every time step, exactly the uh, location and rotation of every vehicle obstacle. So this year we have five teams um, from different institutes and companies participating in our races. And we include the baseline controller that we provide to every uh, participant. So there's six controllers in total that we evaluated. 
Uh, we opened the submission portal about 10 days before the actual submission deadline. And we have since received a seven, 16 different version of submissions, which we all provide feedbacks on two of the mini rays. Uh, on the right, the screenshots, you can see this is a, a simple layout of how the leaderboard is. So basically, as many of the uh, participants also see this, um, if you submit a controller, you can find out the results, the video results, how much you score, uh, on the leaderboard sites. And we send additional debugging information, data logging information to you through email. Uh, on the top uh, right corner, on the bottom right corner, this is a barcode that will lead you to this uh, exact website that has like all the final races and uh, two of the mini races that we provide uh, to you before uh, that's using a slightly different racing configuration that we help you uh, see how your uh, controller is making progress. So by the end of the deadline, we uh, we we have received a, a five controllers plus a baseline is six controllers in total. We, as that we already mentioned, we have two type of races. One is solo races where you are racing on the track with other NPCs trying to avoid NPCs, and the other scenario is head to head competition uh, where there's no scenarios and you are only competing against another controller that another participants submitted. In the solo races, what we do is we found five uh, custom racing track, uh, custom, customized racing configurations. We race all the six controllers on those five tracks with five customized uh, configuration. So in total, it's 30 races at all. And we've, we found out that 25 of the races has finished within the timeout limit we, we set. Uh, it's 83.3% of finish rates. In the head-to-head -head competition, as I already mentioned before, uh, there's no scenarios. So we only want you to compete with other people's controller to see who, who, uh, who can beat who. And we are using asynchronous night mode to uh, assure uh, fairness here since both controllers are racing at the, using the data from the exact same timestamp. And uh, we don't want one controller to take 20 minutes and the other controller to only use one second to finish the computational overhead. Uh, we, are, we also, uh, we raced each other, uh, each two controller twice, but switching the initial position to make sure there's, uh, uh, to also make sure it, the race is fair. All of the 30 races we, we have uh, evaluated on, we see that 23 races, both controllers finished. Uh, so it's 76.67%. Uh, mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. So next we are going to show some very interesting results from the competition, both solo races and head-to-head uh, uh, -head races uh, that's going on. So these are all coming from the real, uh, real competition data. On the top left, you can see two teams, EMI and Edis, are racing against each other very fiercely and sli there's slight modification. Uh, then Edis seems to take uh, control over uh, EMI. And in the middle, top middle uh, picture, you can see Mercy is racing in a very interesting way. It's starting to uh, entering the corner from the outside line and then it tries to speed up and goes into the inside line. So this mimics like the uh, simulates the real like uh, human racing drivers would do is to following a racing line. Uh, on the third picture here, it shows the Go Health, uh, Go Health racing team detects a human that many other controllers fail to detect and collide, but it quickly recovers from the emergency stop and going on. Uh, top left, uh, bottom left here is Alice uh, on track five using the motorcycle. You can see it's trying to avoid the the vehicles in front of it, but then hit the vehicles on the on the left line. Uh, and in the top middle part, there's the overtake for the NPC that's taking place. Uh, EMI decides to go to the right line and overtakes um, the NPC here. Top button right corner, it's another uh, head to head races. And it seems like uh, there's a huge collision going on uh, at the start of the at the start of the races. Uh, and it seems like SBU this time uh, beats Mercy and take the lead. We want to uh, say a big thank you to all the teams that submitted their controllers and contribute to our uh, grace competition. Uh, there's two teams from UIUC, one team from UNC, uh, one team from Stony Brook, 
and there's one team from Dallas. Uh, thank you a lot for participating. We, uh, we appreciate a lot. Uh, this slide, we are going to talk about uh, once we have your racing data, racing results, how are we going to evaluate you, uh, your, your controller and overall? We have two different uh, configuration of race. One is solo race and one is head-to-head head -head races. We decide to do them uh, separately, to rank them separately. Uh, for solo races, uh, that we already mentioned how we keeping the score for each track, uh, for each controller. And here we are using an, a point system that's, that wants to reward uh, the controller with the least points on certain track, which means least point, again, least point, which means it per performed the best. So this is the point system we are going to, we, we did use. Uh, the first place gets the most points. The last point uh, place gets the least points. And if you did not finish during our timeouts limits or stuck anywhere, uh, the controller will not receive any point for that track. Uh, in that racing configuration. Uh, in the second head-to-head -head races, uh, what we did is since we only there's only two uh, controllers racing against each other, if you win, like under the time limit, if you win, you will receive three points. If you lose, you will only receive two points. If you did not finish, you will receive one point. With that in mind, we can also, we can, we also plot some additional data uh, from, from all the controllers uh, in each of the solo races. So we can see how each controller is behaving uh, at the time going through. Uh, we are thinking of adding this to, uh, we already provide uh, the participants with some of kind of uh, data feedback uh, and uh, to help people improve on their controllers. We are also thinking this could be one of the next step, uh, 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 more visualized tools to help people uh, keeping track of how their controllers behave on certain, for example, here you might on the top right corner, you see like Mercy uh, accelerates real fast through some corner and maybe take a slow break and then um, accelerates out again. So this will provide some insights into how the controller is behaving. And we will think about uh, like how to provide more visualized data to controller, to, to participants. So this is what we see as the uh, single races results. Uh, we can see SPU, the green, green dots means like you are the first one in the races. Uh, the, set, the orange color means uh, in this track that this controller has the second place. So very interesting thing to notice here is track three. Track three is known as the most complicated and the longest track uh, we provide to controllers. And in this track, we use the cyber track. Cyber track, as you can see in the previous uh, videos, it's also a very large track and very hard to very hard to control. So it, it does like fits our expectation that track three, uh, some controllers does not finish well because track three has the most difficult uh, racing configuration. And track one is what we provide as the default case in the Docker to participants to develop their code. Uh, we also did a different configuration, different car and different scenarios on track three and track four. That's the mini races. Um, that's the mini races you see like in the, in the leaderboard uh, before the submission deadline. Um, that, that's the two tracks. With the multi-races, uh, again, we raised each controller's, uh, each controller controller peer twice, but swapping the initial conditions. So we also see some interesting cases that like one controller wins, but after you swap the con uh, starting points, another controller uh, wins. So this is uh, maybe show some insights into how people designing the controller. Are they sensitive to uh, starting points? Are they sensitive to detecting uh, uh, opponents at a different location? Uh, that, that's uh, another very interesting uh, results we could look into. So next I'm going to hand it over to Professor Mitra to reveal our final winners for the head-to-head uh, -head races and solo races. Right. You, can, you guys can unmute and we can all clap together. Yes. Oh, wasn't that an exciting presentation? Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, it was fun to see all the head-to-head -head races. Um, just give me a second here. I'm going to take my time uh, because I'm sure no one is anxious for me to move to the next slide. 
All right, so uh, are you ready for this? Okay, maybe you can do the calculation in your mind uh, very quickly. We already showed you the table and maybe it's obvious at this point who's winning. Okay, if not, here we go. Solo race, the winner this year is SBU. Came from behind and Go Heels Racing was number two. Well done again. Uh, actually, Go Heels was going, uh, was at the top of the leaderboard until the very uh, finals, basically. So well done, both teams. And last but not least, uh, third position goes to EMI. Amazing team. Uh, this happens to be also one of the student teams from Illinois, which had nothing to do with us. They are part of a class. And they took this on as a class project and uh, they placed third. So well done to EMI. I don't know if any of you guys are here on the call, but well done. Okay, and for the uh, duels, for the head-to-head -head races, here we are. First position goes to Mercy. This is the team from Galwa. Great to have you guys and well done. Uh, position two is tied between SBU and Edith. Edith is another student team from Illinois, and SBU is, of course, uh, Stony Brook University. So, well done. And the third position goes to EMI. Okay, again, congratulations to all the winners and uh, everyone who did well and everyone who participated in this competition. We had a great time having you and working with you. It would not have been worth all the effort that uh, our team has put in here uh, without your enthusiastic participation. So thank you very much for that. Okay, so now we're going to transition to the uh, discussion and we'd love to hear your comments and your experience and the way we are going to do it is first we'll have uh, well christina is going to mod moderate this i'll let her take over uh, but before we do that one final word from our team um, so as i mentioned at the beginning of this presentation uh, the grace team has also um, participated in a number of outreach activities. And this has been very generously supported by NSA's uh, Science of Security program. And we are looking forward to doing more of that. And all the material that we are creating in the process are also available to you. So if you want to do or replicate or build on any of these activities in your university or institution, you are more than welcome to take uh, whatever material we have, whatever code we have, and spin up your own version of it for um, outreach activity. So let me just mention a couple of things. We set up a little booth at Engineering Open House this year at Illinois. Uh, those of you know would know this is a big event where all the labs open doors for the local community to visit and see the research that is going on at the university. We often get 10, 12,000 visitors. This is restarting after the pandemic. So the numbers were a little bit lower this year, but we are right up, we are going right up there again. So for Grace, we set up a booth where we showed the, um, the competition, the testing pipeline, and we also had set up a little, uh, uh, little steering wheel driving system where kids could go, come and drive their own uh, car against the autonomous cars. Also, uh, we had a nice web interface, sort of like what you would see in today's driving assist systems. You may not see the screen, uh, may not be able to read the parameters here, but basically you are setting certain parameters, uh, like in adaptive cruise control, how far behind should you follow another car, how quickly should you accelerate and so forth. And so the, the, the visitors could choose these different parameters to design a, a rudimentary autonomous car and then have it run on the platform and get quick feedback on how their controller did. Uh, so that was sort of fun and uh, very engaging. And, and that activity got us a few awards. It was very encouraging for our team here. 
Um, and the second activity I wanted to mention is we are going to do a summer camp. Okay, so this is going to be a, a STEM based camp for uh, high school and maybe even middle school students where we are going to spend a week uh, with uh, 20 or so students and talk about uh, various aspects of autonomy. They'll visit various labs and also they'll uh, understand and code uh, parts of an autonomous uh, vehicle. Okay, so that's the plan and all the material that we are going to create for that is going to become available to you. Okay, so with that, uh, let me stop and we will now uh, move on to the discussion Q&A uh, part of the program and I'll have Christina take over. Okay, so hi, my name is Christina Miller. Um, and so now we'll just have a short little participant panel discussion. Um, so if you were a participant in Grace, if you could uh, start your video and unmute yourself, um, then we can uh, have our discussion. Yeah, so I guess uh, yeah, if you could just uh, raise your hand if you were a um, participant in Grace, then we can. Okay. Do you want to ask a specific question? Yeah. Two, two hands. Okay. Maybe you can first take the question, then we can get ready to find, and then you can call upon them. Yeah, so um, the first question that I'm going to ask is uh, if you could just give us a quick high level um, overview of uh, your experience with Grace and um, what you thought about participating in the competition this year, that'd be great. So I think um, the order that we'll go in is Aditya first, uh, then Avanov, then Stanley. Um, yeah, so the I think uh, we, we didn't uh, I didn't participate in Grace last year, but uh, like you mentioned, uh, the, the addition of AWS was a big uh, advantage because uh, you know we didn't have the um, uh, the right GPU uh, machine to run the uh, thing, so it was very convenient to use AWS. And um, um, like the documentation also was pretty good, as in the uh, you know all the ROS messages and uh, post perception data that we were getting. So that was documented really well. And um, uh, like um, we didn't face any issues while uh, running the system. I feel uh, the architecture was really, really smoothed out. So that was, uh, and it was uh, a very fun competition for us also. Um, so that was uh, my experience guys. I think Abhinav can mention something that he found difficult. Uh, simple. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, should I speak, uh, Christina? Sorry. Yeah. So I work with uh, Aditya only for the. We are from SBU basically. So we work together on the controller and uh, we were advised by Professor Sandy. Uh, it was a fine competition. It was the first time we were taking part in it. And as Aditya said, like uh, it was a quite smooth process overall. And it was a fun while debugging and while uh, while going about. Like we had multiple strategies all over the time. We and many failed. <laughs> and yeah, it was a fun scenario. Maybe we can go with the algorithms that we use maybe later. But 
yeah and i i have like because we are not from the machine learning world as such so at least i am not with uh, as experience uh, so i was glad that it was more on the post perception side so we can just uh, work on the pure algorithms of lane change or finding path planning or path tracking and as such so that uh, really smooths out uh, the post uh, like the perception part for us so in the autonomous drive so that was good for me yeah okay um I have seven bullets that I wrote down, so I don't know, maybe a lot of comments, but it's okay. Some of the things were mentioned. So I, I really like the video output on the website. So you couldn't, not just the leaderboard, but every single race you could go and see the video. That was really cool. Um, uh, uh, Shine also talked about making the controllers available for research. So I, I really like that idea too. Uh, so I can imagine a number of research projects where, um, you, you know, I, there was a, a work I was doing with uh, Abinov. I'm doing like test generation for for you know, autonomous control algorithms, right? But this is very uh, unimpressive if I'm designing the controllers and then I'm finding the tests that crash them, right? So having uh, uh, controllers that are somewhat reasonable that other people design is, is, is very helpful, I think, for research. Uh, so that's point one. Uh, two is the AWS image. So this was really helpful, right? We tried to buy a computer because we, this is why we couldn't participate last year, right? Um, and it was actually hard to get one. So like Amazon, I think they had one in stock and we ordered it and then it was delayed for shipping for a month. So, so I don't think it was in stock, right? Uh, so having the AWS image was sort of critical for that. Um, there were some challenges that came up though. So there was a specific instance we needed for AWS, which I don't think you have access to by default. Uh, so I could access this on my account, but the students couldn't access this if they created a new account, for example, uh, just because I'd used it for a couple of years or something, I somehow had access to it. Uh, so then we had this weird sort of setup where I was starting the instance and they were actually using it. And for some reason it would freeze. So I don't know if other people were using AWS or not too, but um, I needed to restart it once in a while, every couple of days. So this was like the, the process I would get. Um, uh, I would uh, restart the, you know, every couple of days I'd have to restart it. So I don't know if this is something we can debug or um, uh, I'm not sure why it was crashing either. So uh, that was two. The third was the, the sensor range. So the sensor range was 60 meters. It seemed, to me, it seemed to be a little bit small. So it would have preferred a longer range so you can do better planning, right? Especially if you're going at high speed, you can't, it, it seems very short. You have to kind of guess what the track is ahead of you. And I wasn't sure if there was a different way you could see the, the track boundaries. The only, the only way we figured out, I think, was you'd have the lane waypoints and then you figure out what lane you're in and then you can guess where the boundaries are for, for that sense of the track. Uh, this seems also a little bit contrived, right? Because I think of how a real system would work. Maybe you'd have some perception system that tells you the track boundaries, uh, and maybe you can see a little bit further. So having the the waypoints and the concept of lanes maybe is convenient because I think Carla provides that. But um, ha having more like a you know maybe road boundaries could make uh, could, could make sense. I don't know if that's possible. Um, the fourth one, uh, the head to head racing. So that was kind of a, a neat addition. When I look at the, the replays, I notice sometimes the, the cars, uh, one car seemed to always jump before the other car, like a fraction of a second before. And I don't know if this is a, maybe this is because it was the asynchronous controller and one controller code ran faster than the other one, right? So it got a, a head start. Uh, or if that, that was this is something that could be um, worked out. Maybe it was just the specific, I only, I only watched like two or three of them though. But I did notice that if you watch it, one car does start to move a little bit earlier. Um, uh, so, so that was a, a question. Um, more detailed score explanation. So I think there was mention that there is this race log that tells you the score. So maybe maybe this is already taken care of. But I do remember I was watching this head-to-head -head race, and then I couldn't. Uh, the cars seemed pretty close to each other, but they were far away from each other in score, right? And then so the question is, if I could see not just the score, but maybe the penalty, right? Like, so okay, this one was out of the track; it lost ten points, or this one caused a collision on this frame. Like, have a little. Uh, I don't know, text pop-up that tells me that you lost 10 points at this frame. That would be a little bit helpful. Um, timing considerations. This is kind of interesting, right? So uh, looking at the runtime of the different controllers would be neat, especially for the asynchronous mode. So if one controller, for example, takes 10 times as much time to run than the other one, that's, that's I think, an interesting observation. Um, I guess in the synchronous mode, it matters uh, a little bit less, right? Because everyone gets to r run as long as they, they, they want to. But again... I guess people know this, they can take a really long time. <laughs> like they could recompute a lot of things at each step. Maybe that's something you want to avoid. So I don't know if having a timeout is the right way to do it, but then you also, then it's hardware dependent, right? What hardware are you running on? So I don't know, having timing information on the controllers could be could be a neat thing to, to, to look at. Um, 
the traffic participants, they disappear after some amount of time, which is, I think, good because then you don't get stuck. But I think maybe it was a little bit too quick, right? Uh, uh, the cars in front of you is slow down and then a, two sec you know, a few seconds later it disappears. Maybe extending that out a little bit longer so you get sort of a bigger penalty for not really, you didn't really solve the scenario, right? You just kind of slowed down or had an emergency break. Uh, that, that, that might be a, a little bit better. Um, yeah, and I think that those were, those were the things I had uh, written down, I guess. But overall, great competition. So thanks again for, for doing this this year. Thank you for all the great feedback. Um, and it looks like Ethan, uh, or John, if you want to. Hello. Maybe I can quickly address. Let me mute myself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, maybe I can quickly address for the asynchronous uh, uh, issue you raised. I think it's true, like, uh, it might be like mostly due to the uh, controllers, like, starting acceleration being different. So what, what I did is like I printing out the basically launched the two controllers. What we did is launch them in parallel. And we also record the starting points like when the file is being launched. And those seems very similar to each other. That's why like uh, I also, we also check like swapping position. So what you see in those cases, one controllers uh, launch very fast. When they swap position, it also launches very fast. So I think it's mostly due to the controller's configuration, like how the controller's implementation is implemented. And it could also be something slightly related to the async class, but things um, different waypoints. It takes longer to compute things like that. Uh, that's just my observation on your question about async class mode. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and it looks like Ethan, um, if you would like to uh, give your experience with Grace, uh, which team you're from and any feedback you would like to provide. Oh yeah, so first of all, uh, Grace was a really fun experience and the team I was part of was Mercy, which uh, I believe we gave it a cute acronym of Method Methodological Racing Computer Intelligence. Um, let's see. So the, the experience overall was, was pretty awesome. Um, I, I really love the testing that you can submit and see your results because uh, we, we ran everything on Docker, so it wasn't clear to us if it would actually run when it got to the right environment. Um, and also looking at those progress plots would be really useful for next time. So to kind of just support that idea. Um, I, I would say that our, our downfall was really in, in the low level control. So we spent a lot of our time doing the, the racing line kind of optimization and path planning. But when it came to the low level control, we saw very quickly that we had tuned our controller for the Tesla and, and basically nothing else. So um, I, I guess to add a little bit more of a critical insight. The first one is the perception doesn't seem very realistic because you don't get to see much of the road in the future. So we had done a lot of weird things with splines to try to extrapolate what a turn is or to try to um, utilize the, way, the, the waypoint information and the, the lane boundaries as a way of trying to understand if a turn was going to happen ahead when we did the racing line optimization. So I, I don't know if that's really a, a, a realistic thing you would do on a vehicle. And so having more boundary information or, or, or waypoint information would be useful there. Um, the other element that was kind of strange to us was what constituted a crash. So there were times where we fully stopped for the vehicle and then a pedestrian walks into us. And so it is kind of weird to get T-boned by a pedestrian. So sometimes the the intent of the pedestrian is a little strange like they they walk into other vehicles and it would be interesting to see if you know if i fully stop in a lane wh why should another vehicle turn into me right I, I wouldn't be at fault in that situation and so it wouldn't be realistic for me to try to mitigate a collision in that event um the other kind of concerns that we had were i guess time budget so we were running everything locally and i had a very fast machine and it became clear that when we were running it on other machines Kind of the execution time took a lot longer so um, understanding that there's a timeout would be something interesting to think about in the future but yeah so th that's all i had thank you um yeah so i guess kind of the next question is um, yeah uh, i had just one point i think i agree with uh, ethan uh, the waypoints thing i uh, didn't mention it in my earlier feedback uh, the uh, waypoints, like they were quite useful. Actually, we use a lot of uh, information from the waypoints, but it doesn't seem as you said it's not because if you can 
uh, if you're able to perceive the cars from way ahead of you, I'm pretty sure there are some more waypoints that you could, uh, like, uh, ideally, realistically speaking, you would have the idea of the curve or the uh, road that is curving through. And we tried extending it. Uh, we couldn't use splines. We just used linearly. Uh, didn't get the best results. So, yeah. And one more thing which I forgot to mention was uh, we were not sure if it was an asynchronous or a synchronous uh, race in the solo. So we had to, like, because we were worried, because we were trying to do some competitions which were quite uh, intensive. And, uh, uh, like, we, we uh, like, uh, discarded that idea because in the asynchronous mode, and the asynchronous mode seemed more realistic. Like, you can't, uh, uh, like, uh, you can't uh, expect me to, uh, you can't expect a controller to take as much time as it wants to take a decision and wait until then. Uh, so, yeah, so we discarded that idea and we went through that, but I think uh, in the end, uh, the competition was uh, synchronous. Though it turned out well for us, but I don't think it was mentioned anywhere, was it? Maybe I missed it, uh, that it will be run synchronously in the solo race and the head-to-head -head asynchronously. So, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it was mentioned, but we can definitely provide that information. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, yeah, so I guess kind of the next question, and we can go in the same order, is if the participants wanted to uh, give a high level overview of how their controller worked, and then we can open it up to um, everybody here uh, to ask our participants questions or just ask general grace questions. So. Uh, so I think Aditya, you can yeah. uh, start. Uh, yeah, L like Abdinav mentioned, uh, yeah, we were uh, a bit unsure about the synchronous versus asynchronous thing. Um, before we were planning to do like a, a more like a motion planning to uh, uh, get a, get get away from the obstacles, and then uh, we couldn't do that because uh, in this asynchronous mode, it was not enough time to you know plan ahead. Um, so, um, and also uh, from the baseline, we built most of our code on top of the baseline controller. And um, we found uh, some issues that, uh, like, uh, during just before a turn, um, since we were using the angle from the car's, uh, the car's viewpoint and the orientation of the car, uh, it would detect the obstacle in front when it was actually on the left or right. So for that, we um, we changed that uh, part to you know uh, take a look at the obstacles from the end of the lane. Uh, so we, we sort of formed like a triangle using the lane, uh, uh, the two points of the borders of the lane as well as the obstacle point, and then uh, you know uh, see if it's an acute angle or obtuse angle to know uh, on which side of the lane it is. Because we were uh, uh, doing most of our motion using lanes and not. Like a free space, so it was uh, dependent on whether uh, the object uh, obstacle was on the left or right lane more than like on the left or right of the car itself. Uh, so I think that was a great addition that helped our controller, you know, not stop unnecessarily for a lot of obstacles and then uh, uh, not turn uh, before time and uh, you know crash into the obstacles. Uh, and also. Uh, Navigating through the pedestrians was one uh, one uh, tough, you know, thing that we had to do, uh, especially because their behavior is a lot different from the cars. So uh, we so, um, uh, we sort of used uh, multiple frames of the of the part of, uh, pedestrians' movement, and so um, uh, once we know the movement of the pedestrian, we went uh, against the movement of the pedestrian. So if the pedestrian is moving from left to right. Uh, then we go the other way and then we slow down for the pedestrian. So uh, we go ahead of the pedestrian once they move away. Uh, so that, that was one thing that we did differently from, uh, you know, the cars. And uh, we've also observed that if we are going, uh, you know, quickly along the turns, then the ca car was like, uh, you know, skidding away from the lane. Uh, so we also, um, you know, did an inverse proportion of the steering angle and speed so that you know it goes in a controlled fashion and does not uh, move away from the lane. And uh, uh, one more uh, strategic um, thing that we implemented was uh, to go back to the center lane whenever there's nothing 
Uh, so it's uh, always easier to go to the left or right whenever required and uh, easier to plan. Like if you're on either extreme, then it might not be really easy to go to the other extreme within time. Um, yeah, so that's uh, basically the high level of what we've implemented. can answer one of the questions that has been asked about the new changes in the graduate level class but if you want to go through the sequence go ahead. thank you um yeah so i guess uh Abhinav, um, yeah. we're working on the same control yeah i think uh, uh that they explained it very well i could just talk about the failure because initially we had thought about the uh, so motion planning algorithm, which is the RT, we were trying to use a basic RT to find the path and uh, try to get to it and uh, try to find the uh, one one thing that we were not clear what could be like in an RT algorithm, what would be our goal point. Um, so and in that sense, actually, that reminds me, we didn't use the waypoint info at all. We used a lot of data that uh, the Grace was providing, but waypoint info was something which I didn't know, like, how should we be using it? Uh, and I didn't even uh, like it could be a goal, but it became tricky. And RD, I think uh, I, I would say it was a lack of create creating a proper search space. I was able to create the obstacles properly, but the search space where it can travel in the road was becoming tricky for me, especially with the lack of waypoints. So that was, and uh, of course, uh, so path uh, RD gives you the path planning, and then you use pure pursuit to track the path that the RD gives. That was an initial idea and that should have ideally in theory worked, but uh, maybe we will uh, experiment on it afterwards. Uh, in the context of time, we just went with the lane approach and uh, yeah, it worked out <laughs> decent for us. So. Thank you. Uh, I guess Stanley, do you have anything to add? Um, not too much. I think Abhinav and Aditya did most of the work and I suggested the things that didn't work. So <laughs> um, I guess this, this, yeah, this lane following approach was, was helpful here, but um, uh, yeah, the RRT one, I think the, the failure they had was um, it was starting to turn too sharply, right? The, the, the yeah. maneuvers were not smooth enough, right? This was yeah. causing issues and also yeah. the, yeah, the look ahead, right? So when you're moving really quick, the it's not the, the perception of the obstacles, right? It's the perception of where the lane markers are, because that's really how much you know the track position and the rest of it you don't uh, you don't know. Yeah. Um, I know last year they had a human driver as well, right? For the competition. So uh, I guess that wasn't done this year too. Well, one comment on that was the human can see further than the car though, right? Because if you see the, the visual thing, you should just give the human the lane markings and the obstacles and see what, <laughs> what they can do. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I think that would be interesting to see if we give the human limited information, like how then that would compare. Um, Ethan, do you have, uh, would you like to give a high level overview? Yes. So the high level overview is we took an RRT approach. And so it's just basically RRT with a mountain of heuristics. So the first thing that we do is we um, take a look at the lane markers and then we try to extrapolate uh, and then we try to um, use that to infer what the road boundaries are. So we remove the lanes eventually, and we just want to know where the edges of the road are. We then try to predict where the road is going to be a, about three times more than we currently have it. And so that will give us um, an obstacle space with the uh, obstacles that are provided to us, as well as the road boundaries. And then we do multiple passes of RRT star. So we want to have um, gold point generation where we don't know exactly where in the road we want to be, but we know we want to make progress in, in some way. So we select seven points as a goal and we run RRT in, in parallel to find out which path is the shortest. And in order to make that assessment, the RRT star needs to converge. So we try to have a very goal oriented RRT star that we use as our first attempt. And that usually gets us the shortest path pretty easily. And so you get nice behaviors, like when you turn, it'll try to aim at the apex of the turn. Um, however, that often fails when you have real obstacles because it's too goal focused. The, the goal sampling is turned too high. So then we back up to a more exploratory RRT star that then is used more when you have more complex collision scenarios. Um, of course, once you have a path, you don't actually know what speed you want to be at. So we have a speed modulation scheme that tries to calculate what the car speed should be based on 
um, the curvature of the turn. So that is what, before we do something that is turning intensive, we try to decrease the speed of the vehicle. And then we also have some, I guess, logic as to if a person is nearby, pound the brakes, which I guess worked kind of against us in the long term because of how often that occurred. Um, but that was just because we kept colliding way too much with pedestrians. Um, and then the, the last piece that we were trying to work in, but we we weren't able to get in time was the low level control. So Aditya, who, who's not here, um, was trying to implement a Stanley controller and a pure pursuit controller. And we were not actually able to get that to beat the, the baseline PID, so we didn't use it. But I imagine that would have helped us a lot with things like the cyber truck, where um, you start seeing oscillations or just um, understeer where the vehicle is not able to follow the path really well. Thank you. Um, can you wait for a second? Yeah, I don't know if there are other people who have been quiet so far, uh, but also had uh, participated if they want to now join the conversation, uh, say a few things about their experiences and their uh, strategies. Like I see nothing is here. Um, oh, Abhinav, you want to add something more? Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 no. This was the old one only. I'll just turn it off. Sure. Uh, I, I can chime in a little bit. Yeah, so some of our, our team, we this is our first year, so there's a lot of kind of learning curves. <laughs> I think on the forum, we probably posted a lot more questions than, than usual just to like understand like how to implement things and how, how does the orientation work and like bicycle model because we, we just learned it this semester. Uh, so that was kind of the, the challenge for us. Um, and then, yeah, just just seeing stuff coming together. We, we had a lot of fun seeing like all the kind of like bloopers, cars hitting the pedestrians and why they start flying and things like that. We thought it was very fun and enjoyable. Um, in terms of our implementation, we actually followed the uh, uh, um, uh, follow the gap algorithm, which uh, our goal was like not to apply brakes at all, and we wanted to go as fast as possible. And then we quick quickly realized that there are other track scenarios where you just have cars occupying on on all the lanes. And so what's interesting is that our our car will try to kind of squeeze through uh, two cars, but the I think the collision box is a little too wide, so we can't like make it through, and and it kind of has penalties. So that was kind of I think it would be interesting to see if if there are like controls that can go through the, the those tiny gaps and just make make its way through. Um, yeah, overall, I, I think this is a pretty good experience. I, I'm, I'm very fascinated by other people's controller, how smooth they they got their cars to turn and even changing lanes. And whereas ours is still a little bit jerky, and that's something we're still learning and, and improve. Yeah. Thank you. So it looks like um, Ed and uh, Parasar have uh, joined us as well. Um, if you'd like to uh, give some uh, your some words about your experience with Grace this year and maybe um, a high level overview of your controller and how you think you did this year. Yeah, I think um, uh, one of the things that I really liked about this time is that uh, my students didn't have to hunt for any GPUs or any laptops for doing any of the tests. Uh, I cannot, uh, I cannot express my thanks enough that it makes our life so much easy to to run a controller. And uh, um, yeah, in fact, uh, this time uh, one of the students leading our team are actually doing most of the testing and refining the controller is. Uh, um, undergraduate student, uh, Han Gao. He was there at the beginning of it, but I think he has an exam now, so he had to leave. Um, and um, uh, so, um, yeah, um, we used uh, 
uh, again, uh, when something isn't broke, don't fix it. So we use something that we had for last year with minor improvements and uh, and looks like uh, now we have to, now OUTS is broken, now we have to fix OUTS, right? So it will be exciting to see, um, uh, uh, to, to give you an idea about what our controller is. Um, we do this uh, reactive planner where uh, at every instance we gather what are the obstacles in the env environment and plan the uh, Voronoi path, which is uh, uh, farthest from all the obstacles. And we try to go along that Voronoi path. And uh, again, if the Voronoi path definitely has uh, some more sharper edges. So if you have a vehicle in front of you, then you have two Voronoi paths, one from the left and one from the right. And uh, because of that, our vehicle has to go take these sharp edges. And uh, that's one of the reasons why we probably didn't do so well. And the other reason is that um, we don't actively try to even compute the race line or um, go along the uh, path of the least curvature. Uh, we take the Warnoi path as the, as the safest one and try to go along that path as fast as we can. So I think, um, yeah, we are looking forward to uh, improving uh, our algorithm much more and, and adding new features to it. Yeah. So, so the, the Voronoi path, though, do you have you have a, a, a point for every obstacle and then you also have points for the track boundaries and then you can show sure. the Voronoi diagram? Yeah. So uh, the, the I think uh, the nice thing about Grace is that it gives us each of the obstacles. So we consider the the uh, there are uh, libraries where you can give it the entire obstacles and then you can compute uh, you can compute these uh, Voronoi regions where uh, your you need not just compute the Voronoi uh, diagram with respect to point but also with line segments and and objects along with it. So we don't sample the environment and say these are the different points and. Uh, give us the Voronoi diagram, but rather there are libraries where you can say this is an entire straight line and there's another straight line. Now give me the uh, split this entire region into into this Voronoi diagram, and we can you can actually uh, use uh, several libraries for that. So uh, we take the obstacles as is that we get from Grace, and we just give it to the uh, uh, the the uh, the algorithm that computes a Voronoi diagram with uh, line segments and uh, uh, and uh, 3D objects. Uh, I see. Okay, so you get like the bounding boxes and the track boundaries. Yes. And then, oh, okay, neat. Okay, yeah, nice. you get the you get the Voronoi path directly. Yeah. Oh, sorry. It's an extension of the basic algorithm, or it's a uh, of the basic Voronoi algorithm, or it's making like a convex hull of the shape. Yeah, so I think what happens is um, uh, technically when when you give a point and a line segment, the uh, again this is probably high school calculus where the uh, uh, the points that are equidistant from a point and line segment it's a parabola. So you get uh, you don't get the actual parabola, but you get some sampling of points on the parabola. So you um, we just do a finite sample of it and just go on the the. The sample that you get from the Warner diagram with the with a finite samples of it, and we keep uh, updating our uh, waypoint to uh, uh, some distance ahead in future. So we don't we we modify it as much as um, yeah we it is mostly run of the mill algorithm. Uh, you can directly invoke it from the libraries, but we just modify it so that we don't run into these problems of uh, having these non-linearities and we just sample the entire path into some sequence of points and go to the next waypoint. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, one thing which uh, I think uh, the videos were public, right? So I think we saw the Go Heels code, uh, sorry, not code, uh, video, uh, when we were doing a thing. I think uh, when there were no obstacles, we were bringing it to the center lane as well. So yeah. that was very useful. And we also use that technique then after that. And it actually helped us to, uh, because then there are much more ways to uh, evade obstacles in the future. So that was, uh, that made sense. And we also actually use that idea from yours. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's, uh, 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 maybe we shouldn't do that. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
it's it's an it's an interesting observation um yeah i think uh, i'm looking forward to uh, yeah even if you think in terms of applying some sort of reinforcement uh, uh, learning where you want to figure out what's your optimal position with respect to all the other obstacles in the environment maybe having uh, your vehicle at the middle makes a lot of sense but again it depends on the horizon right if you are if if there are no other yeah. obstacles the horizon then you can probably go much faster along a uh, uh, route which is less curved but yeah again i think the it 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 all depends on um how the how the obstacles are generated and um, yeah 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 that that brings me to a question um uh, how are the scenarios generated again uh, because uh, uh uh again maybe this is a pitch for our iccps paper as well we wanted to characterize some sort of difficulty of scenarios and say uh this scenario is more difficult than this and uh, uh is there any is is there any way to uh uh characterize or how do you generate these uh, scenarios in the grace uh, racing and uh, uh yeah any any interesting ideas uh, out there so yes, so we basically build on the uh, scenario render provided uh, along with uh, Carla. Scenario render is already an uh, open source um, GitHub repository uh, uh, tool you can use. And we we will also release our final racing uh, configuration, the scenarios we decide to use. Basically what we did is we modified some of the uh, scenario, scenario um, like, like cutting lines behaviors or ahead of vehicle behaviors and combining them together at a specific point. So as that way mentioned in the presentation, there are five eigen uh, scenarios, base scenarios, and then we choose uh, two or three like randomly from them and put it into some trigger points inside of each track. And that's how we generate the scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there any way that yeah, you want so, to? Um, uh, yeah, go on. I actually uh, listened to uh, your uh, presentation in ICCPS and there are uh, obviously interesting parallels. So you're actually trying to generate scenarios that would push the software, the controller software to the limit. And here, at least for now, we are seeding some scenarios and we have a systematic way of generating a combination of scenarios from a set of base or eigen scenarios. So as a testing exercise, we could potentially try to cover the space of scenarios that are covered by the eigen scenarios, okay, by running many more tests. Uh, we have not done that. Uh, that would be an interesting research direction. Uh, another direction is actually to generate the right kind of basis scenarios that would foil a family of controllers. Uh, so you can imagine we could even have two tracks for this competition, right? The red team, which tries to break the submitted controllers using some smart testing technology and the racing team, which is trying to build a controller, right? So we can think about that for, for future versions. Yeah, that's neat. Having like a, a parallel testing competition where it's like test generation for specific controllers. Yeah. Uh, yeah, if the, that's a neat idea. Uh, also, for some reason, uh, in the pedestrian scenarios, uh, the pedestrian always coming from the right to the left. We had tried to have an algorithm to detect where the pedestrian is walking, but I don't think we got it to use in any other like direction, which is like left to the right. Was that like hard coded for the right to left or something like that? Yes, that's hard coded uh, uh, from right to left. Uh, yeah. We can make it go at any angle, but that's just the choice we did use. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And uh, final question, are the scenarios reactive in any way? Uh, in our scenario, it is not. So that's why uh, some, some participants mentioning that like uh, the car stopped, but the, the, another person ran into it. Uh, that's happening because the scenario right now it's static, not dynamic. But that's that's a good advice, and we could look into it. Mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. for yeah. future improvement. And, and I think on that note, that would encourage people taking more risks when it comes to racing as opposed to just breaking first thing. So is there room for a third competition, which is having a pedestrian cross the street? You develop this dynamic logic, right? And then you could run all three of these at the same time. Yeah, so this is changing uh, topics a little bit. So there was a question in the chat from Ed, I think, about potentially using this uh, for educational purposes. So um, I have uh, posted a link to a course that I teach here at Illinois on safe autonomy. And in that class, the way this competition was used this year was as a part of a one month long project. So uh, at various stages in the class, we introduce the students to this competition, the software architecture, the various components. And in the class, they learn about RRTs, planning, hybrid A-star, among other things. They also learn about lane detection and control. Uh, control is actually uh, quite relevant to this PID control uh, stability. And then uh, the project is, uh, they could do various things. And one of the options is to participate in this competition. And several groups did. So Nateng here, who, who talked about their, their strategy, uh, is one of the participants. And actually, they did quite well. But in going forward, you can also imagine breaking up various parts of it and making into homework problems. And that's what we want to do. So you can do a little lane detection inside Carla. Uh, right now, we do it in Gazebo. Uh, but it could well be in Carla. Uh, you can do uh, just RRT for, uh, for, for the car. That could be another homework problem. Uh, so there's, there is uh, definitely a possibility of using it that way, and we are planning to do that uh, going forward. So yeah, short, short version of it is uh, definitely we should stay in touch, and if you're developing this, then you know, it'll be great if, great if we can uh, you know, work on the same repository and not develop too many different uh, forks. Yeah, I'd like, uh, we are I'd also like planning it. to do a summer school based on this, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be for even younger uh, students, high school students. Mm -hmm. So uh, for that, we might even have some Python versions, uh, which is even easier and lighter weight than running Carla. So uh, TBD, I guess, uh, what, what exactly we do there. Yeah, I mean, for us, we're I'm a computer science PhD student at UNLV, and um, the course we were looking at was like going to be like for senior level and uh, graduate students. So, unfortunately, I mean, at least in my opinion, there's a kind of bias in the professorship at our school against Python. There's a lot who like C sharp, and there's a fair amount, and there's like one school that likes C sharp and one school that really likes Java, but as a group, they tend to not be very. Uh, they, there are no CS Python courses that specialize that. The Python course is left for like the physics department, which I think is a mistake, but um, it's part of the, it's the reality of what a lot of the undergraduates are coming up with. So like being able, linear algebra they have to take and they have to do some um, machine, there are machine learning classes available so they can learn about neural networks. But Python is, it's, it's going to be like something where I'm like, I have to basically spend this summer try and GRAC on my own to see what I can learn and see how I can build this course. So thank you for the link to your site because that could be, a, uh, that might help as a starting point. Yeah, and I'd like to keep talking later. I mean, over the, as I develop it over the summer, I'm gonna be trying to build lesson plans and I'm just trying to figure out how to, how I can get them. So a lot of this is just, there's so much like preliminary information that they need and I'm trying to minimize that so they can spend more time actually doing what's interesting about it but you know you got to understand all the basics before you even get it like you got to understand those basics to get into this so i'm trying to balance that for them yeah um just a quick uh, follow-up so python is something we don't teach them uh, uh i think in our curriculum also students actually learn cc plus plus and this is something we expect them to sort of pick it up on their own uh, and you're absolutely right about your second point we have to break it into smaller chunk 
to make it into programming assignment level activity where instead of like a big project and yeah we can talk offline and there are various different ways of doing that yeah i mean it looks amazing i haven't i haven't had the ability to do it myself but we do have a good digital uh the mechanical engineering department actually has a very good robotics lab that competes here and they use gazebo and open ia ai gym a lot for their simulations and their and they're developing they're developing like half dip controllers and telepresence robotics so i would like as a department that we like have more interaction with them and develop but again sometimes there's politics where it's just like getting cross department boundaries can sometimes not be as easy as you'd hope it would be so that's that's the other issue but the fact that you guys are using gazebo and open ai is encouraging because i feel like that's like testing itself is such a huge part of software development and yet it comes into the student's education very late if at all and i feel like that's another weakness of like cs education right now is that testing and simulation i think is critical to developing software and yet we really don't teach it very much or at least not nearly as much as its importance more merits anyway but yeah i definitely will try to uh, get in touch with you later as we, we develop it it'll be probably me working on this over the summer and then we'd give the first session of the class this fall Uh, yes, yeah, so thank you uh, for everybody that participated, and I think this was a great discussion um, with all of our participants. Um, so we do have another discussion right after this about how we can improve grace for future iterations. Um, but before we do that, uh, if everybody would like to take about a five minute break and then we can reconvene and um, have further discussion.